Hey everybody, Jay Shlansky here from the Fifth Trooper Network. I just want to take a moment to thank you for checking out this show. Did you know that over at thefifthtrooper.com we have tons of other content, including blogs, other podcasts, all kinds of stuff. In addition, if you want access to exclusive content, you can join us on patreon.com slash thefifthtrooper and join at any level and you'll get access to uh, exclusive blog articles, access to our private Discord, and much more. So please, Check us out, and thank you so much for all your support. Welcome to the Notorious Scoundrels, a Star Wars Legion podcast bringing you the latest news, general perspective, and competitive discussion. Hello, and welcome back to the Notorious Scoundrels podcast. I'm Kyle. I'm here with mike and mike how you doing guys i'm doing okay i'm tired (laughs) but otherwise good yeah um mike cirillo just got back from golden sprue this weekend which was in upstate new york it is uh and kind of drove home halfway in a blizzard so it was a (laughs) it was a long 55 hours shall we say from friday afternoon to sunday evening getting home Mm. (laughs) <laughs> I'm about halfway in a blizzard. It's been like 70 degrees down here. What's going on? Uh, so it was really nice on the way up. You know, we drove up. It was like 43, even going into Syracuse, or not Syracuse, into Albany. So that was really strange. Um, last year when we were there, it was negative 13. Um, so uh, it was literally that. 53 degrees warmer. Um, and then coming home, it just started to snow halfway through round two. Um, and then we basically left after round two. And the drive back to Jersey was pretty horrendous and then jersey and the pennsylvania was pretty easy as we got out of it but um driving through the mountains with the snow when you can only see like 20 yards in front of you was terrifying especially yeah. when it, you know you've already played two rounds of legion and it's 12 hours into the day already yeah. that's right yeah. yeah driving i mean driving in snow period is harrowing uh when you're on a long trip especially and it's not like just like well i just got to get to the grocery store and then i'll be you know yeah. um but mountains in particular, when you're on the slopes and like you got the inclines and stuff, it's like, ugh. yeah, I've driven, I've driven home to Chicago and my share of like driving through the mountains in Pennsylvania in snow and yeah, it's hard pass. Awesome. Yeah. Um, well, I'm glad you made it back. Uh, I understand it was a good time. Basically, like there's, there's a bar like right next to the Legion tables, essentially. Yeah, yeah, technically it's like eight yards away. You just have to walk around the corner. Uh, but it, <laughs> okay. It's really fantastic. And they have heavy pours, so everyone has a good time. Awesome. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about your Golden Sprue experience. We're going to talk about the Gian Ocean Assembly experience because um, Mike and I have both, Mike Barry and I have both started putting them together. <laughs> I think you're a little farther along than I am, Mike. So maybe I just, I don't have the full uh ptsd yet but we'll we'll get to that we're going to talk about how death from above works because we finally got a forum ruling on that uh we talked about the overrun thing last week but not death from above and then we're going to talk a little bit about kind of splitting up on objectives and when that's a good idea and when it's not so uh but first mike cerillo yes tell us about golden sprue Sure. So um, we ended up doing five rounds of Swiss. Um, turnout was a little lower than we were originally hoping for. So we ended up having 24 players. Um, no drops throughout the event until the very, very end when it started to snow. And there was a couple of players that, you know, just wanted to go home. Yep. Um, but everyone got to five play five rounds. Um, and we ended up, unfortunately, having both pair downs lose both pair down games. So we had five, four and ones at the top. And it ended up being broken by SOS. Um, so I ended up finishing second, which was cool. Uh, I feel like that's been the story of my year so far this year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, always like, a bridesmaid. Uh, yeah, it's like my fourth, second place finish in tournaments and they've all been, <laughs> or three of them have been SOS and then one's in like, so what, when was the other times, Mike? Uh, yeah. Um, so we've had <laughs> see two locals crucible. Yeah. We keep going. Um, <laughs> but I ended up playing Anakin Padme Cody, uh, cool arc echo and then some dodge spam core and on the arcs. Um, phase two Z6s are really good with SA. 
phase one captains are really good with SA and DC, and full arcs are good with SA. And then Cody has surge crit out to range four, so he's pretty great in the mirror. And I was expecting to see a lot of armor and a lot of clones, and kind of ran into that. Um, but I ended up, I played five games. I don't really want to go through each one, um, but I did get to kind of run the gamut for all the factions. Um, I got to start my day with the one that I obviously can't remember. So I'm going to jump to round two real quick. <laughs> Let me just jump into the, the game of Link. Um, I ended up four and one, though. Let's see. Yeah, and just real quick, the other four and ones um, were Gian Ocean List. That was Evan Bullris. Um, a Imperial Remnant list with Death Troopers and one Dark Trooper, Marcus White and uh, Alec Rayer played an Experimental Droids list, and then Michael Stason played a Shadow Collective Mandal list. So those were the other. There were a total of five four and ones. Yes. So. And then uh, my apologies on the delay there. So yeah, no I worries. Ended up, I ended up playing Echo Base Defenders round one. Um, I had not actually played against that list yet, so that was interesting. This was the double T-47, double FD version, mm. um, which was kind of terrifying in 11 activations. Um, but I was able to pretty quickly shoot down the T-47s with Cody and an RPS, um, and they, they kind of did what I expected them to do. Um, ended up taking that one on intercept. Uh, let's see. Round two, I got to play against Stazzy, um, who finished four and one with the Shadow Collective list. Um, it's a Gar, Mando, sorry, Gar Saxon, Bosk, and... Yeah triple mando with the shields rockets and the the precise guy um and man when they save they save <laughs> i was pretty scared for a while um we ended up playing vaps and i was i was blue he had to come to me and uh snagged a unit early uh i'm sorry he snagged a unit early for me um on the mando rocket shot when the clones decided not to not to roll any tent dice um and then i chased down gar saxon with anakin and was able to to kill them so i won by like 16 kill points and it was pretty terrifying when none of the mandos would die <laughs> it's just like paint paint um but it was a really fun game uh round three i got to play against the 14 act ewok list um this is my third time playing against it uh and my first time losing unfortunately um but it's also the first time i've ever been full tabled like every Oof. single model off the table um <laughs> just too many ewoks anakin, so anakin went two for ten on defense uh mm. at the very end of round two and everything just kind of spiraled from there so at that point i was just i was just running i got forced into either breakthrough or payload um and i had to play mm. payload because the table when we set up for breakthrough he was just going to run down one side and there was like literally a wall that i would never be able to get over to to get to the heat box so i tried to force an interaction and at least make a gunfight and um unfortunately lost the gunfight so that was that was a little unfortunate. Um, man, I like Yoda better against Ewoks. He's way, oh, way stronger. Yeah. It's not even close. Not close. I'll, we'll talk about that when we talk at the the end here. Yeah. Um, I got to play Nick, my co-host, um, round four. Um, we had a pretty quick sab game. I was able to knock out the activation early and just kind of turtle for the rest of the game. And then round five, I played the guy that I drove up with that ended up rooming with Pat. Um, who finished, uh, I think, fifth or sixth at PAX. Um, he was the the Anakin player with the severed Dooku head on his <laughs> on his base <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> to match the card. Yeah. Um, but we played a basically a mirror. He was playing Anakin Cody as well, but he had some more decked out clones, and I had Padme instead. And uh, on intercept, I was able to kind of just use the extra tokens to weather some of the giant fire support shots, and uh, just kind of seal the deal at the end there. So I finished a pretty pretty comfortable four and one uh, top gar, and. I don't really know if I would play this list exactly for Worlds, but I think it has a lot of really good bones, and it was super fun. Um, Mike, you've got some experience with Cody so far, as you kind of proved to Pax. He's really good at cracking the mirror. Um, yep. He's really good at surge crit, fire support. You know, he's, if they don't have SA, they're going to be taking wounds because you can generate so many aims with Anakin and Padme, especially with offensive stance that you're always going to get that lethal trigger. But he doesn't do enough against Ewoks. He just physically doesn't have enough dice to replace that arc trooper shot at range two because the Ewoks have to charge you. Yeah, and ten like, dice with sharpshooter one against Ewoks is a big deal. Yeah. If you whiff <laughs> one shot, you're just totally screwed. Because it's like, oh, here's my 105 point unit, and um, oh yeah, I'm gonna take one model off the table, and now it's gonna charge me to safety because it's gonna activate six times after I go. Yeah, and um, yeah. I just don't think it has enough tools to handle that consistently. I think it can win, but I I wouldn't stake my you know, $1,500 Adepticon trip on it. I'd probably, probably go back to Yoda for that. 
I yeah. do think the SA spam that I was able to run with it, though, was super strong. Having just over half my list have situational awareness with Padme and Anakin around is so good. And um, I want to explore the actually a double DC captain with SA for the phase ones. Um, I think Sam was doing that with the Pike list. No. Yeah, yeah, um, he, he had that's what he had. All the clones was too. it double? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, I I have Pikes now. Um, you know, about two years after the release, I finally <laughs> yeah. finally got them in my bag over here to the side. Um, but I do want to try it with some SA clones first before I commit to that route. Why not both? I could do both. Um, I've been having fun with the all red saves though. Um, and I think just making that little tweak from the Yoda Padme list into Anakin and more SA has has actually played pretty well for me, even in the mirror. And I I want to see if I can really kind of break it to my own style first. Yeah, yeah that's fair. Well, I got like four games left before Adepticon that I can physically play, so I'm gonna have to cram, but uh, I'll give it a shot. That was my golden sprue experience. It was a good time. Awesome. Yeah, sounds like everybody had a good time. It was very much a uh, like hang out and play Legion and drink and have fun kind of tournament. So yeah, they we we I shouldn't say we um the people at the network who put on the event um declined the world's open invite just to kind of keep it a little bit more I don't want to say casual but a little more laid back. Um, we actually our grand champion was totaled off of sportsmanship, hobby, and skill. Um, so the actual winner of the tournament wasn't even like one of the five of us that finished four and one. So I'm glad that there was no invite attached because it just let everybody have a good time without any kind of unnecessary strings. There are a lot of 40k tournaments that have like a, um, you know, they have they have different awards, obviously, but they do like a best general, which is like whoever wins the tournament by record and stuff. And then they have like a, you know, best painted award. And then they have like the overall event award is basically the combination of those two things and, you know, weighted in some fashion. Mm -hmm. But that's super common for like, the GW style games. Um, so it doesn't surprise me if, you know, there's a Golden Sprue is actually technically a 40K slash Age of Sigmar event okay. that we just happen to prove that Legion is better at. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, why, <laughs> that's why we have a lot of those rules there is it's still put on by the the Warhammer community and that's why it, it just kind of bled over into the event. Yeah, makes sense. I like it. It's cool. All right. So speaking of hobbying, how about we talk about assembling Geonosians? Um, Mike, tell me about that look on your face right there. That I, it, this, for, for those that are listening, this it was is all a, I have left. These two sprues. That's it. You're almost there. I'm almost there. They're all. See them behind me on the table. Yeah, no, not really. There's a little bit of glare, but they're all sitting there. Um, look, these models are beautiful. They're. A little bit poseable, which is which is a, maybe a, probably a first, right? B ones had ball joints, so B ones were also fairly okay. poseable. That's fair. Yeah, they were poseable too, but I don't know. It's not the same. I feel like I mean, it is, it is, but it is. Um, the, the B ones were not nearly as detailed. Yeah, so. I, it it feels like these guys um, are very poseable. Uh, this is the hardest Legion kit to put together by a lot. Uh, yeah. I don't know exactly how much more, but it's definitely at least an order of magnitude harder than the hardest kit this game has had previous, prior to, to June Engines. Um, and it's, it's honestly, it's not the models in the kit that I thought it was going to be. I thought the guys that were like standing on rocks and like were elevated would be the problem it's the guys that are just standing on the ground there's just so many pieces that go into their legs there's like each foot is a separate piece and then each leg is a separate piece and the joints for them the joints for the feet to the leg aren't bad but they're like it's not intact enough to like stop it from slipping they're and they're yeah, they're peg joints, but they're very small pegs. Yeah. Um, yeah. and you which you should definitely use plastic glue, otherwise you will totally glue your fingers together. A and uh, are you using super glue or plastic glue? Just oh, I I you gotta use plastic glue. It's not yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, um otherwise your stuff's gonna break too because these are super spindly. This is the my work in progress. I just I, I've taken to starting with just this part. Yep, that's what I do. Of, yep, yep. 
Um, get them on the base. Get that the torso yeah. and the legs on the base. Get it glued. Let it dry. Move from there. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, the because you essentially have to use plastic glue. Nothing like like plastic glue takes. You can kind of stick it on there, but it takes time to like fully set. And I've noticed a lot of my in my first box of Gene Oceans, a lot of them have like this lean, this backwards lean. lean. They all lean. Um, yeah. Which I'm sure I'll I'll have that sorted out by the time I get, you know, at least halfway through these guys. But it's just, as you noted, it's just really difficult to like, because they're, you know, the feet are different. So there's a, two connection points here. There's connection points between the feet and the base. You know, each foot has, because they have those cool, like, they're almost like bird-like feet where they got two toes on the front and two toes on the back. Each foot has four connection points with the base. Um, and then... Which you would think would make it more stable. It does not. No. It, it, because the connection points are so narrow yeah. that like it just, the, the foot's like, oh, yeah, do you mind that. if I flip up on my side? No big deal. <laughs> you <Yeah. know>? like <laughs> While uh, you're trying to connect it at the ankle to the leg yeah, at the same time. Yeah, you're like applying yeah. like some pressure and then all of a sudden the foot just like shifts <laughs> at a 45 degree angle and you start swearing up a storm <laughs> sixth, sixth time it's happened to the last hour. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but they are they are amazing looking. The sculpts are incredible. The poses that you can put them in are great. Um, but yeah, it's I'm I'm with you. It's 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 different. Look, I put together GW minis for twenty five years, um, so I'm not like easily intimidated by sprues. But this is a this is an objectively difficult build. I would strongly recommend that if you have only ever played Legion and put together Legion kits, if you want to get into Geonosians, I support your decision, but you should probably only buy one box, see if how you how it jives with you, and then buy the rest if you feel comfortable moving forward. <laughs> um, yep. Because these kits are really hard to put together. Yeah. I will say I'm impressed... I wish I had a oh here we go. I'm impressed by something on these sprues. This is a bad example. I have the wrong sprue for this. Are you are you gonna um, uh, the stacking thing? Yeah. yeah I actually basically... so I can I can I, I've got them right. Okay, here. yeah. Right. So like normally the sprues are like independent of each other, but these uh -huh. have like holes in them where you can I'm gonna, I'm gonna mess this up uh here. So so they they like sorry, get up to the camera. They stack like this um, can you see that okay yep um which which is weird uh i actually found it really difficult to get them out of the bags without breaking anything uh it, yeah so pro tip cut the bag with scissors yeah yeah um because the the thing is so they come they come in the bag like this yeah, and the and the it's like one of the standard Legion bags. So all of the spindly bits are like pressing against the bag, and it barely like it. Like if you just like try and pull it out, like it won't come out of the bag. Um, so yeah, be very careful. I think for the most part, like the I think it may have been intentional that these these bits here are taller than most of the things on the sprue, so it doesn't it, catch. It yeah, it protects all the delicate wing bits and stuff like that um but yeah get, the first time i took them out of the bag i was like this is kind of i feel like i'm performing surgery right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like yeah. playing operation yeah right. yeah i was like i i'm, I'm not feeling great about this uh, yeah 100 <laughs> percent. because i mean they're, the the bits are fragile because geonosians are spindly yeah uh, and there's a lot of detail on these things the wings the legs everything um, but yeah, I'm I'm impressed with how they designed the sprues to make them slot into each other, and then how they also made those pegs like stick up to protect the actual mini pieces. Like that's that's great sprue design. For as frustrating as these things are to put together, um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, my only thing is I wish that the legs and the feet were one piece. I think if the legs and the feet were one piece, I would be like, that would make a big difference. Yeah, it would be huge. Um, the the reason for that I suspect is similar to why the B one heads are two pieces, which is essentially like if you want, you know, because of how molds work, right? You're you're like pressing two pieces together. So on the on the part of the mold that's 
essentially where the mold line is. Like you can't put a lot of detail there. Um, cause you know, it's like making a sandwich, right? Um, we actually oh. had, uh, yeah, one of the sculptors on Corey DeVore. There it is, um, yeah. yeah, we had him on, this was ages ago. <laughs> that was still a thing. Uh, but, uh, and he basically explained like the reason for the B1 heads being two pieces and it's so that you can get the detail like all the way around which yeah. based on how these feet are where they're like the bird style feet kind of kind of makes sense i guess um, i, I i'm but... gonna fight you on that one because the flying dudes feet are definitely attached to legs uh yes but in those cases most of those feet um have like if you look super close there's like a, an easy spot where you would put the mold line and maybe I guess maybe they could have potentially done something similar for uh, the grounded feet. Uh, each of the flying dudes does have, like I've I've got my scattergun dude here. Uh, I think this foot, the foot that is not attached to the base, was a separate separate piece as well for probably a similar reason. So, um, a foot that is not attached to the base. No, it's not. Really? Yeah, that's all one piece, man. I've got it right here. Uh, okay, right. I I distinctly remember at least one of the flying dudes having like a separate foot. Maybe it was maybe it was Sunfac. I don't it know. may have been. Yeah, it's definitely oh, the. Trust me, I've I've assembled yeah, it's, five it's this of guy. these boxes over the last four days. Okay, yeah, um, it, it must have been Sunfac. I think it was like, Sunfac. Yeah, yeah. Um, because the flying dudes are considerably easier to put together. <laughs> they really are. Yeah. So yeah, I. Look, I'm just speculating based on my understanding of like why they did the B1 head thing. This strikes me as a similar situation. But yes, if the legs were one piece, they would be astronomically easier to put together. I'm sure they've got a good reason. I'm still going to gripe about it. Yeah, I will say just from a technique perspective for those that are going to attempt this, for those two piece legs, I have found it's easier to like actually glue the foot onto the leg before you try and glue the leg to the torso because the foot actually has like a peg it does. slot that fits pretty tight and like doesn't like wiggle around that much um so glue that let it set for like a minute so you can still like rotate it a little bit if you need to so the dude's not like you know doing like a like a pizza slice like ski ski thing if you put him on the base wrong um but yeah let the let the feet set a little bit uh after you stick them onto the legs and then stick the legs onto the torso and then immediately uh use super glue between the foot and the the base and glue the feet onto the onto the base. So what I've been doing is I've actually been flipping the model upside down. Yep. Putting the legs on the torso and then putting the feet on top and then just flipping the whole thing over and then posing it while the plastic glue is all drying. Um because yeah. it's a lot easier to shift that way. Mm -hmm. And the upside down thing was a big revelation to me because i was like trying to like hold the legs and then put the lay of feet on that doesn't work no it, it doesn't yeah yeah not looking uh, forward to this bill from nick <laughs> 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 the more you talk the higher the price tags get <laughs> yeah. yeah nick nick charge like three hours per box for assembly um, i i actually it might not be three hours but it's definitely like it's definitely an hour and a half to two. I, I think. think it's about an hour and a half. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's roughly fifteen minutes per miniature. Uh, at least now I'll get faster. This was my first box, so maybe it's like not quite that long. But I would say it was for me. It was like the first box is probably like twenty. I think I've gotten it down to like eight ish okay. per miniature, but that's after putting five boxes together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now that you're almost done. Uh, yeah. I um, will say I did poggle in Sun Fact first. And uh <laughs> I put like in the group chat, I was like, man, if if Poggle is any indication as to how hard these things are gonna be to put together, I'm in for a rough time. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah Poggle was tough because he had like that extra connection point with the cane. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, he's let's see, where is Poggle? Uh here he is. And he, he actually has multiple like weird connection points between the pieces because he's got the cane. He's like holding his 
beard for I'm lack pretty, of a better yeah, term i think it's like i don't know it's, it's, like it's man, mandibly things coming up yeah front. it's like, the uh, geonosian equivalent of a beard anyway he's yeah. like holding it with one hand um and then he's got the separate piece feet you know so it's it's like multiple different things this is why you have to lose use plastic glue because you're gonna have to move it around a little bit after you stick everything on there yeah <laughs> you use super glue and it sets you're just screwed yeah, 100 because screwed. you're not going to be able to adjust it so that it stands up right <laughs> it just isn't gonna happen yeah i got a dude uh in the first box i'm not super proud of and hopefully he just blends in with the rest of them but he's definitely like like at a 45 <laughs> degree sideways <laughs> angle <laughs> I've got a couple. I was able to fix my slanted guys so they kind of look like they're like dodging out of the way, yeah. or you know, um, yeah, yeah. I tried to make him look like he's doing one of those like first person shooter like wall leans yeah. a little I, bit. I, I promise um, he won't be your last slanted. Uh, no, I'm sure he won't be. <laughs> yeah, they'll anyway. blend in like the backwards B1 bodies. I'm mm, sure it'll be fine. Yep. Oh, I did at least one of those. Yep. There's like one or two per squad for me. <laughs> well, because I was putting them together upside down, I've been, had to. I've, I definitely have put the legs on backwards a couple times and had to take them apart and put them back together. Because, mm-hmm. um, like, when you're looking at the legs, like it's actually not super. Like, unless you're being very vigilant about it, they're not standard legs and they bend kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, there's two knee joints. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, the quote unquote correct way to do it is so that the top knee joint is like a normal knee that goes forward. Yeah. And the back knee joint is more like an ankle, I guess. But yeah, it's weird because they're like, it's like a, yeah. I, I definitely made that mistake too. And I, luckily I was using plastic, plastic glue. glue. So I ripped it off and I flipped it around. But plastic um, glue is so great. I will yeah. say, I went through an entire bottle of plastic glue. I went to a store and picked up a new one today. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> that's good to know because mine's mine's uh i guess it's about half full yeah uh, i'm hoping that this lasts me but we'll see I'm not optimistic on that front uh-huh. thankfully they're not too expensive but it's it's nice to see that you use the same same brand it's yeah, the it's citadel. The citadel. It's, it's the just, way to go i is. i i normally don't champion the like gw like you know whatever but their paints and their glue are actually really nice all their hobby stuff is great. Yeah. It's definitely like a little bit more expensive than you would pay for other stuff, but it's worth it. Yeah. It's worth it. And part of it is just that's what I'm used to because that's what I grew up painting. So like when I when I see a color, like I know what that color is and I know what it's gonna look like when I paint it. Um whereas if I've you know, there's there's lots of other great paints out there now. Um, but I just part of it is just, you know, it's what I'm used to. So I know that Screamer Pink or whatever is going to look like Screamer Pink. Not that I use that color that often, but <laughs> you know what I mean. That just happened to be like actually what's like right here in front of me. So, um, all right. So that was Geonosian's assembly. Should we talk about Death from Above real quick? Because they did actually yeah. like rule on how that works. The, CRB text is sort of unhelpful in that it just literally says what the reminder text it's says. It's just a reminder text. I took <laughs> one look at it when it came out and I was like, oh, all right. So we're just going to, yeah. Did you the think forums. there'd be like an example or something in there? Uh, uh, yeah. I don't know. I, that's a lot of extra Photoshop, man. I know uh, that we have like a new rule book now, but I really just want the RRG back. I just want the bullets and the the clear definitions of things um anyways this isn't about that this is about death from above it is yeah but you have to go to the forums to figure out how death from above works which i think is kind of your point right it it is it's just like it's not even like a like a if your opponent asks you how death from above works and you go to the rule book it doesn't actually answer the question (laughs) like it doesn't even it doesn't even try to answer the question really it is is my issue um it would be one thing i think if like it 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 was like death from above this is what it does and it just yeah it doesn't do that it's yeah so how does it actually work based on the forum post 
Yeah, so basically, um, at the beginning of the game, right, you determine the terrain, the height of all the terrain pieces on the table, right? So um, terrain is going to be height one, height two, height three. I guess, in theory, you could have a terrain piece that's like height negative one. Would that be height zero still, I guess? Like if it was like below the surface of the board. Like a trench something. or yeah, something? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's probably going to be zero because I don't think Legion deals in any kind of negatives right now. Okay. No. Yeah, so maybe it's still really height zero at that point. Um, I don't actually, I haven't had it come up, but I'm sure that like somebody somewhere has something that like puts a hole in the board. Anyways, um, so rather than death from above triggering when you are just strictly touching, like you're higher than your opponent, you have to be touching a terrain piece that is a numerical height value greater than any terrain piece that your opponent is touching. You have to be on a terrain piece. You have to be on. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um your unit leader specifically. Correct. Um and it has to be higher than the defending unit leader. And yes. the defending unit leader. So if the yeah. rest of, if they've left their unit leader kind of off the terrain piece so that like they're not messed up feel like I don't know, like a difficult move or something. Um and like left things weirdly elsewhere, like you can still get them. But basically what this means is that um if they're not in like if they're like just using cover and not touching it you just need to hit something that that's hype one right? you just need to get on something that's you just need one. to be on yeah. something right if they are pr touching any terrain piece on the board if they're on any terrain if piece. they're on sorry yeah. um you Which... need to you need to basically be on at least a height two terrain piece to deny the cover right uh, which could be a tall ask depending on most points it's going to depend on your beta almost it, it definitely is yeah. like it's definitely going to depend on like just kind of the terrain you have available and stuff like i there are you know i think nick's tables are actually pretty good with like there's a lot of taller terrain pieces on those tables um but I mean, I, I'll say like even in my store, like we don't really have a ton of height two plus terrain. Um, it's pretty uncommon, I would say. It's yeah. hard to transport as well. Yeah. Yes. So it's it shied away from. It's it's bulkier. You know, it's bigger. If you make like cool like towery terrain, it's easier to break that sort of thing. You know, like. Um, so, anyways, uh, basically the TLDR is death from above you need to be at a numerical height value greater than whatever your opponent is getting the cover from. Um, and it's the height of the terrain that you're on, not necessarily where your miniature actually is. Cool. Which which could get potentially weird with like terrain pieces that are a variable height, you know, have like things sticking out above them. Um, it's also relevant that the attacker, so the Geonosian unit, um, cannot be on area terrain for this to work but the defender does the, the same restriction does not apply that to the defender so the defender could potentially be on area terrain of any height um you know and if that area terrain which you know could be like a tree or something right that's like height two or height three is is taller than the terrain piece that the gene ocean is on even if the defender is like essentially on the table surface because they're on like the you know they're on the say the felt for example of like a forest um, and you're on a height one building with your Gene Ocean unit, they could still get cover from that if if the area terrain piece is taller than the terrain piece that you're standing on. So taller in terms of height categories, not in terms of like raw inches. Um, so yeah, it, it could get sort of weird. I think most like probably 80% of the time when this is going to trigger, it's going to be a situation where the Gene Oceans are like obviously on top of some kind of obstacle terrain and the target is just on the table surface. I think that's going to be pretty frequent. Um, I, I saw a good bit of it over the weekend. Yeah. yeah. It's, it was pretty much that, where they just jumped onto like a height one building or they jumped onto a rock that was like height one and they were just shooting at people behind barricades and behind pieces of, you know, just heavy area terrain. Or sorry, yeah. sorry heavy heavy scatter terrain. I think I think this is, Death from Above is going to be used to negate scatter terrain like 95% of the time, I think. That might be a little high, but... I think most of the time, like if like if you think you're gonna 
like you get sharpshooter too if people are like on buildings and stuff it's not really going to happen so one question about scatter terrain i was curious what you guys think about this because scatter is a the overhanger rule only applies to obstacle terrain right and scatter terrain is yes. not obstacle terrain i would have to check i i i i posted this in the discord the other day and people seem to think that this was the case but i i admit that the new like terrain categories and stuff are um still a little nebulous to me but i think basically at least where i landed on this is you could potentially like lean a unit leader up against the side of a barricade and technically be on that barricade because the overlap rule doesn't apply to uh scatter terrain and then thus defend yourself from death from above at least if the Gene Ocean unit is on height one. Um, you know, you'd have to like slow down and stuff. But um yeah, I think there's some weird shenanigans with the fact that you're looking at the height of the, the height category of the terrain and not the actual height of the miniature. And um, you know, previously there wouldn't there would never be a reason to do that on like a piece of scatter terrain. Uh <laughs> so I don't think that it's really that explored. So I'd be curious to see if this ends up being something that somebody asks on a form ruling, but um, yeah, I think that the overhang rule only applies to obstacle terrain, and you could potentially go on like a you know non height zero scatter terrain piece with just a small portion of your base and not get hit by death from above. But I believe you're correct as of page twelve. Okay. Yeah. Um, That's where I'm it not talks about the fitting on terrain and obstacle terrain. Yeah, I'm not necessarily advocating for people to do that. Um, I think uh that's. And I don't know if it should work that way. Uh, Whether it works that way or not, that's also like if you're if you're going to the extent of like making barricades difficult for your like if your opponent if you're making your opponent use barricades as difficult and also like put them make it so that they're like attached to the barricade. That's still a win. Sure, I'm not saying it's good necessarily yeah. or something that you should be doing. Um, clearly if you already have like a speed one unit or something I guess who cares but um, yeah I would I would have rather if the rule was literally just like you know Geonosian's here defending unit is here he's yeah. higher therefore you can death from above um, that would have been much more intuitive I think for me and then you don't have to worry about like terrain height classifications and all that nonsense but whatever um, so uh, yeah, I think it's it's probably somewhere in the middle in terms of like effectiveness. The thing that I just described probably would have been the most like aggressive reading of that. And then, you know, there were people like, well, is the table surface really height zero or is everything, you know, all the way up to height two, height one? Um, and that, that would have made death from above like totally useless. So yeah. this is, I think this is a good thing for the keyword as far as its effectiveness is concerned. It's definitely not useless. And yeah. it, you're definitely going to be able to trigger it probably multiple times a game. Yeah. Um, and a lot of tables still subscribe to the idea of if you picture like the major offensive corners right off of the panhandle, there tends to be two larger buildings that you can use for cover. Yeah. So especially with a lot of our centrally placed objectives, you know, using that that free jump to get on top of it to deny the cover with death from above is incredibly easy to do and oftentimes will be rewarding. Yeah, I've also found that like these guys are fast enough that sometimes they're just not in cover just by virtue of you being able to like move, move, shoot. You know, because you're so close. Because yeah. you're so you're. Yeah. I mean, like you got to get to range too, anyway. Sure, right? right. And and like current units, units that we're used to outside of like speeder bikes, um, and and this sort of applies to speeder bikes too. Like one of the reasons that speeder bikes get things in the open so often is because they've got the flexibility and maneuverability to like use two moves to put themselves at a weird angle that your opponent really couldn't account for before the the speeder activated right and i think geonosians are pretty similar in that um they allow you to kind of just move into positions that they wouldn't have cover from anyways because they're not you're, you know you're you're touching the terrain or whatever. You're yeah. touching the terrain or you're positioning it so that like you're actually on the other side of the barricade that they were using to like hide themselves, you know? Um so uh yeah, I don't know. I think I think I think there's still 
you're still going to get a lot of no cover shots with these guys for sure. Yep. They're also unfortunately made of peanut brittle. <laughs> oh yeah. Man, every time one of my Geonosian units gets shot, I just pick it up off the table. I'm just like, oh yeah. Uh goodbye. <laughs> Glad I have five more. Uh you know. <laughs> like yep. um and uh yeah, they just die. Um once I would say that like once you commit a Geonosian unit to shoot in, like you should just assume it's dead. If it's not dead, nice thing to have, but uh they yeah, they are peanut brittle. They they die like B1s, but there's only five of them. <laughs> <laughs> yep. If they lack a lot of the defensive tech that a lot of other fast moving glass cannon units have. You know, they don't have the agile, they don't have the build in cover. So as soon as that player gets the good shot into them and they're pushing four or five past cover, you know, here's your squad. Yeah, they're just dodgeless rebel troopers defensively. Yeah. It's just my favorite thing to shoot at. <laughs> <laughs> the nice thing is that if you are triggering Death from Pub, you probably have heavy cover against something shooting you back, in theory. Unless they uh, move up and touch the building you're on. But, unless they yeah. move up and touch the building you're on. Which is like reasonable because you're at range two. You're at range two. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, that uh, whole like ranged it's easy it's easier to get no cover shots at point blank range thing it goes both ways, right? It totally <laughs> does. <laughs> um yeah. Um all right, cool. Uh all right, the last last bit we have to discuss basically centers around since we're talking about gene oceans we're talking about things that are fast um which brings up a conversation so hang on okay. wait you're gonna interrupt me i was gonna i was gonna put an asterisk on a fast and can fast I, and I, yeah go fast ahead. and numerous I'm okay yes say numerous okay. i think that that's very an important aspect to this conversation it is yeah so basically we're talking about when should you split up to contest multiple objectives or objectives that are typically considered like quote unquote um, safe is the wrong word because there's no such thing but essentially like backline you know rear area more I of guess like you could call them objectives objective. yeah right yeah. um you know we're talking about like intercept the intercept point that would be you know on certain deployments clearly like battle lines there's there's no home intercept point but yeah um major defensive know, they're definitely Right, right. Um, intercept, uh, KP, VAPS, um, recover. You know, there's there's a lot of objectives that have something potentially in the middle, and then like some number of things that are mu that are closer to your opponent than they are to you. So, um, what goes into your calculus when deciding? All right, I either not need to hunt the middle objective. Or try and contest both the middle objective and their quote unquote home objective. I think the first thing that you have to take into account is deployment. Um, that's arguably the most crucial aspect of how to determine what is, in fact, your home base. Um, and if we're talking about like advanced positions or major offensive, you know, traditional logic says that you deploy in that little square for major, you know, basically where the the home intercept point would be. Um, and then in advanced positions, that's a little bit more. It's a little bit less static, you know, because it depends. It's so far with that range six that terrain pieces in the in the zone can really affect where people drop down. Um, we're sorry, plot down their units. And I think that's the first thing that you need to see is just physically how close are they to your your home base, um, how close are you to your opponent's home point, and then how close are both of you to the middle. You know, if you're both, so we'll say roughly range three from the center, but they're they're five from your home base, you could dedicate a few more pieces to the center. If you do play something like advanced positions and they've deployed much closer towards the middle of the of the table, you might also look to drop a few units in your own long range section so that you can threaten that home point because you might have to pivot if they decide to almost pinwheel around the top. But I think that's the first part is just physically where are the the opposing minis. I think for me, um, when I'm thinking about this principle in practice these days, um, I don't really consider anything to ever be safe, even if it's my home stuff. There's a lot of units in the game right now. I think specifically 
this is really from a like a low activation garless perspective um more than anything else but i think it applies kind of universally it just we feel it a bit more because when it comes to things like kp and intercept you know we're starting the game with we've only got eight things that actually can count right um and there are several lists out there that are like i have 12 things that count or 14 things that count right and you know we've seen games um like on stream and just like regularly that you know like the ewok player will split like seven activations and send it after you're like your safe point right <laughs> while while you know there's another seven activations or you know fighting over their safe point in the middle and all of a sudden like you're kind of in this weird situation where you know you can't you can't win a seven to one fight on a on a kp or intercept point and i think like you know when it comes to bikes and stuff uh, they tend to also be in higher activation lists that protect the bikes from getting shot so that they can go late in the turn and kind of steal steal an objective from you. So because of those reasons, I kind of look at these objectives a little bit less as take and hold ground objectives and more as like, I need to take activations off the table as soon as possible. Like I just need to start ripping their stuff up and and because the thing that makes this easier and not an issue is once you've evened out the activation disparity once the activation disparity is gone you can you can have a safe objective you can you can not worry about that as much um and i, I to me you just you you got to go hunting early and often in those situations Yeah, I would agree. Um, especially with with Gar, uh, I mentioned that their location is hyper important, but that location also tells you where they're not and where they have to go to. Um, and in games that I know, like we've played against each other, it's been fairly obvious from the get go where the I'll say like the Yoda base is. Yeah, you know, if there's that the rock in the building that's just at five o'clock from the center, and you're gonna be in heavy cover, you can see down both sides of the table. Um, like that's where you want to get to, and I think your point is super accurate that you're going to go hunting, but you're going to go hunting from this spot. And I, and determining that early based on where the opponent starts, I think is hypercritical. It is. And I think like naturally for me, the, that position tends to be basically halfway between whatever would traditionally be my safe point and whatever the middle point would be, whether that we're playing KP or intercept or, you know, uh, recover the supplies it's it's halfway between my safe stuff and the stuff that is like neutral ground right um because like at the end of when it comes down to like turn five and turn six because in these matchups where this is important you need to be able to have the decision to flex forward or backward if you need to if you're on the center point already and all of a sudden they start stealing your back point um it's like three or four moves away. Like you're not going to be able to do anything but like quad move backwards to go get it, which means you're not shooting the stuff off the point. Whereas if you're equidistant, yeah, if they attack the middle, you're like a little bit farther away and you still have to aggress, but you at least have the option to go forward and aggress or go backwards and aggress or split your army and do both because you that's the thing sometimes you have to do, right? Yeah, I think the Jane Oceans present a little bit more of a an involved aspect for that of making sure that you're not too far committed to the middle or too far committed to the to the safe spot. Um, like you were talking about, double move and shoot with them is something that's super super reasonable, and they do this at their speed three, right? Their speed, speed two. two, speed two. Speed okay, two. Yeah. so even at speed two, you know they can get mm -hmm. a lot further than other units can, and unlike a lot of speeder bike lists that we saw in the past, with like Blizzard Force and Staps, not only can they kill your units back home. Um, but they could also take your objective. Like they can physically score it for the opponent. And um Yeah, they got the yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> they can tap the VAP, they can pick yep. up the box. And if you've already overcommitted to the middle, your quad move to get back there is totally irrelevant because they have the objective and now you can't even shoot them off of it. I mean, realistically, like if a Geonosian is just inside range five from your evaporator, they can last first and tap it with that unit. Like that's a thing that gets <laughs> 
range five is really far. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, it's, it's an yeah, echo shot. <laughs> yeah. Like it's it's you know, um, that's basically deployment zone to deployment zone. So if they're like just outside their deployment zone, they can last first to have your evaporator if they're a gene ocean. And that's something you need to like keep in mind. And it's something that like I don't see people do often, but like later in the game, particularly like if your opponent doesn't have a force push, sometimes it's good to just kind of like surround your evaporators with dudes so they can't actually evade them right uh, yep. without melee in your squad um and it actually like it, it makes it so that they at least need to bring two units to do it um so uh yeah that's the thing but gene oceans are very fast i i stole somebody's back point with poggle the other day <laughs> <laughs> who also despite being speed one because he can triple move is like super fast um yeah i mean he's basically like a normal speed two yeah unit except that he's essentially not slowed by difficult terrain because his speed is always one so well, and he can just jump over like buildings right, yeah. <laughs> right? Yep. Um, I mean, we know how far commander vader can get out on blackable even without burst and he can do that boggle can do that every turn yeah yeah, yeah. Yep. that's a pretty long range it is it is and it's just like i just like last first with boggle and took their back point and i was like yeah <laughs> um and uh yeah, they're all very fast. They're all very quick. I, I think Geonosians are going to um, bring into the equation, like people are going to have to think about that more similarly to how like the Ewoks change some of these objectives, right? Um, like Ewokless fight, force fights over multiple points instead of just having multiple, like one contested point in the center of the board. Um, uh, that's actually where I was hoping to lead the conversation a little bit. Um... I don't know. Have you played against the 14 act Ewoks a lot or a fair few times at this stage? I wouldn't say that I've played against it a lot. I I would say that I, um, I probably played it somewhere in the realm of like five to seven times. I have yet to not table it, I guess is the big thing, gotcha. but you got to go after it fast and heavy and like you like the first couple shots you take, each shot's got to pick up an Ewok squad, like an entire one in one go, which means you're like, you're forcing like, I don't know, 11 hits past cover or something like to reliably do that. Um, so you're, you're talking about double arcs, I assume with these. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I've pretty much <laughs> it outside. Best, of, it is the best way to kill them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I definitely think that there are other lists that can do it. You know, the dark trooper list that we saw, over the weekend and in Australia with the, the fire sports from Gideon um, can do it. Uh, I do think that like fire sports, like the best way to deal with Ewoks. Um, uh, but... And or sharpshooter. Yeah. Sharpshooter is big too. Magna I just Guard are also like exceptionally good at dealing with Ewoks because they can do it at range. And then even when the Ewoks hit. Yeah. I, I definitely think that like, if you let the Ewok player get into the melee scrum that they want to be in, like generally at that point, the game might not be over, but it's probably pretty close unless you've attritioned them to the point where uh, they've only got like three squads left or something when that happens. Um, I don't know. Yeah, talking about the splitting squads with them directly, I think a lot of our prior advice kind of goes out the window for the Ewoks um, and you just, you hunt. And yeah, that's what I'm saying. You got your your entire turn zero is where am I going to be shooting turn one? And where can I make sure that they can't hide from me? So I think sometimes that even forces you to take a a less advantageous deployment. Um, If you know that you start in the open, but you're not really, you know, you can start a little further away from your stuff a little bit more in the open, knowing that at worst, you might get hit by like a CB or log trap turn one, and you just have to save anyway. Um, but you just you have to move you have to get to that ideal spot as quick as possible because if you're not shooting them by halfway through turn one you're just gonna lose yeah my turn one against them often looks like my full arc scouting directly towards them um me guidancing like a fire support unit towards them so i can hit it at range three and then like taking like range two fire supported shots with arcs like as soon as possible um it's- 
Yeah, it's the rare time I start with the Yoda two pip. Um, because I run the <laughs> yes. bat, I run the bat med on the on the double full arc. So getting yeah. three full arc shots turn one um usually puts a pretty good chunk into their into their numbers. The the move move shoot off the relentless card helps a lot. In yeah, it and when up. and when you can do it like with the echo full squad twice, um, you're reliably picking up three Ewok squads. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's definitely how I handle it. I think I think I mean it's one of the reasons it wins games is because not a lot of lists have the sheer amount of firepower required to go hunting like that, right? Um. And I do think that, like, with the prevalence of the amount of 14 activation Ewoks we see, um, I do think that, like, a well-played Gar list is kind of like a natural predator to it. But, like, a lot of the things that are trying to prey on Gar right now are not very good into the Ewoks. Like, the things with, that are, like, focusing on marksman, high velocity, all that stuff, like, those dice pools are small. They're not big. Um and those are like the last things you want to be shooting Ewoks with. I will say I faced 14 activation Ewoks with a list like that. Uh, it was the Cassie and Han Chewie thing. The first is that Han and Chewie just kind of helped a lot because I could counter all of their Han Chewie shenanigans with my own Han Chewie shenanigans. But also just generally, I ran the thing with the full commandos and that full commando shot with the sharpshooter one. Like if you can catch the Ewoks in light cover down to none you know there there were a couple times where i picked up like an entire naked ewok squad in one shot with a full commando unit um so it yes a list like that definitely would prefer to like not face <laughs> uh, <laughs> something where it's about a body count yeah but i was i'll just say that i was pleasantly surprised by how much raw firepower it had like outside the you know pierce high velocity stack just because of how consistent everything is with particularly with sharpshooter um which is really important and useful against ewoks but uh, even like the vets you know if if the vets are at full strength which they're going to be until the ewoks get yeah, like to melee basically you know with that critical like they can they can force easily four to five saves uh, on an ewok unit at range 3 so um, and suppression too. Suppression against 14 activation Ewoks is super important because, yeah, they got Inspire with um, Log Ray, obviously, but it's still like kind of a limited resource. And if you can force 3PO to have to like move up with the Ewoks to cover them with a Compel Zone, that's pretty huge. Because if you can start shooting 3PO, you know, either you kill him if if he doesn't have any Ewok unit like babysitting him within that range one circle, um, or you know, you start cashing hits against 3PO uh, and picking up Ewoks that way to bypass low profile. So Yeah, that's big. If if you can take shots in the 3PO, just dump shots in him. Yep. If they're guarding him, great. If he dies, also great. Yep. You know. You're, you're killing something every time you're shooting him. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so thing... suppression important against 14 activation Ewoks as well. Okay. So I've also seen a number of... Um... They actually, some of the players are swap have swapped Han into Leia, and Leia has Vigilance and Portable Scanner um, <laughs> on the Ewok list for the 14 Act. Yeah, um, and it still has a massive bid. So picking your target priority there also becomes way more important because some of these Ewoks are running around with heavy cover, low profile, and two dodges. Yeah, and they're no timing into spots that you can't get to them, and um, making sure that you don't lock yourself out of that positioning is is massive. You know. If you've got your your fire sport set up and all of a sudden he just drops the the two pip for no time and he walks around the corner, you can't overcommit to uh, to that one angle. Yet another re reason the guidance on Yoda <laughs> is amazing because Anakin can't deal with that situation. I learned. Yeah, I'm sure you did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> You're like, oh, they played no time for sorrows. Guess I'm screwed. <laughs> I mean, I'd already lost Anakin by that point, so I was extra sure. screwed. But <laughs> sure. Say yeah, I think the the Wookiee battle force has kind of played similar to me as well. Is that you just need to go hunting for the Wookies as soon as possible? Yeah, I think the Wookiee battle force scares me a lot more than um, the Ewoks, just because uh, specific, specifically the ones that put Yoda in it. Like that just just changes the game so completely. All of a sudden, you do need to be scared of getting close, like like kind of going Wookiee hunting, because all of a sudden, like. If you're Wookiee hunting at range three, they can charge you, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so, 
it it just it can get awkward very quickly um, but it's it, it's definitely less of an issue of like splitting objectives um in those lists i feel like they just because like you're like between they're between like eight and ten activations you're kind of there's a there's a battle line it is clear right the ewok list sometimes just like yep we're sending three guys around the back only three i mean <laughs> against republic like yeah. you, that could they, be enough well they still need to like hit your front with like if they send seven guys against your 800 point guard for me like they're just gonna die right um so i do think in to that effect i think from ewok player perspective and anybody that's splitting off units to contest multiple objectives, you should definitely only send the bare minimum. Because whatever you're sending is probably not contributing to the fight. And if you're splitting, yes, you're you're like forcing your opponent to think about splitting, but they're gonna have less far to go, which means they can probably split later than you, in theory. Um, unless you have like made a move to split like with a speeder bike or something and they just can't get there at all because it's like turn six, right? Um, in which case they've already made a grievous error. But I do think I, I see a lot of people like splitting off, like like splitting Ewok armies in half and sending them in two different places. And I think that's a really easy way to lose the game. Because really, like your what your opponent should be thinking in that turn is like, let's just fight half the army, kill it, and turn around and kill the other half. Um, and and like because you don't have ranged weapons with the Ewoks, you're not supporting each other at all. Yeah, you would be relying on a pincer, and you know if one of those sides is dying because there's only seven units there, you can't pincer. Right. Exactly. Um, so I definitely like the, you know, if you're going to kind of do like a back cappy thing with Ewoks, two units, two units is more than enough to like half, like get somebody to have to invest resources in dealing with and two naked units Ewoks is like 70 points. Like you're, you're not down that much in the big fight. Um, and your opponent's going to have to invest more than 70 points in dealing with two squads of Ewoks. Yeah, it's about it's about essentially disrupting those situations where your opponent would normally plan on throwing like a generic commander or a strike team or something on their back point and and just having them kind of check that box and now suddenly they have to deal with two Ewoks, which is way more than they can deal with. And then, you know, maybe they don't even have like another cheapish scoring unit to throw back there and they gotta divert like a core unit with a heavy or something, plus probably something else. Back almost that way. certainly yeah, right yeah. like, gonna have to like, be, like one push. phase one core unit against like two ewok squads yeah, like, it's not I'm, enough. Not, I'm not okay with that you, yeah. i'm gonna throw echo back there to deal with nope that ain't gonna work either yeah. you know i'm gonna have to send two units all of a sudden i've got to invest like 150 points into killing seven right exactly like, a single short trooper is not going to be enough right and, yeah. and, and we've just been exclusively talking about gar but if you can pull like even a death trooper away from like a remnant list you know, if you have two death troopers shooting at the body of your army versus three, that's a massive difference for you as an Ewok player. Yeah, I will say one of the things that you can use to counter this is range. And the fact that death troopers can reach out and get you at range four means that potentially, like, if you if you stick that death trooper ball in the right spot, you could kind of cover both Multiple bases. Ways. Yeah. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, you're just you're looking to create asymmetry with your matchups, right? You're looking to force your opponent to devote more resources to like check the box that should have been essentially safe for them than they expected and devote more resources to it than you are. Um, and then hopefully that pulls enough stuff off the front that you can then overwhelm them with your other however many units you have. So yeah, and I think you know when you when you're doing this and splitting units off like that your main priority should be to keep those units safe as long as possible which means yep. abusing terrain as much and as often like just hug the buildings they shouldn't be able to see your units until you're ready for them to see your units right. um 
And that that's a big part of it. Like if you can't, if you can't make sure that that happens and you allow them to like pick your units off at like range three, when you split them, you might as well not even do it in my, in my opinion. Right. Sending them across a killing field is just throwing away points. Yeah. You know, it has, like you've been saying, it has to have a purpose. It's got it. Yeah. Um, and you, you have to be able to make sure you can do it. Um, if you can't, if you can't a hundred percent guarantee, maybe not a hundred, like 98% guaranteed, they're going to have to split something off from your army, their army, like you are just making your position less strong on the table by splitting your stuff. And this is partly why it works, or that it's at least easier to do with units that are fast, because they can kind of threaten multiple areas at once. You know, you talk about speeder bikes or G-notions or something that can get across the table. You could easily put them in a position where they could either contest your opponent's one point or just go score on the middle objective. Exactly. And it's, it's one of those situations where the later that you can stall making the decision to split it the better it is like if you split your army on turn one because you've put them in different areas of your deployment zone your plan is telegraphed um like you're, you're telling your opponent what you're doing before the game even starts and you're allowing them to concoct a way to deal with it the later you delay the split the the higher the probability is you're going to catch your, your opponent off guard um you know i think that the mo the the times that I've seen it the most useful are the times where it's like turn five, the end of turn five, and you're you like double or double move an infantry unit or triple move an infant uh, like a speeder bike unit to set up to contest a back point, and all of a sudden your opponent's like, I only have like one unit on my home KP, and I can't really deal with that. So all of a sudden they've got to like concoct some sort of weird plan to deal with the situation because it really wasn't face up on the table until the end of turn five um yep yeah it's pretty common especially on objectives like kp for your opponent to be sort of counting like all right how many units can i contest the center kp with and usually with at least with like a more static trooper based army it's it's pretty difficult to put your guys in a position where they can either do that or score the home KP, KP. So, you know, if you can wait until they've essentially committed and they've put, you know, X number of units in contest middle point category and X number of units in contest home point category or score home point category, uh, then that's when you can kind of make your determination if you want to try and flip the script on them. And essentially what you're doing is you're forcing them to change their game plan from I'm going to move units to score this VP to like I have to kill X number of units or they're going to just have too many things. And if you wait longer, you can force out those higher power command cards early so that when they need to kill three units to score their home KP, they just simply don't have the resources for it. Right. All righty. Um, any final thoughts, gentlemen? Uh, Cody is fun, and I want to play him more. <laughs> Welcome yeah. to the Republic. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, looking forward to Worlds. And I'm just kind of getting geared up for that. And uh, you know, nothing crazy. So I think this is a good talk about splitting stuff. Yeah, I'm excited to... I know assembling these Gene Oceans is a pain. I feel like they could be a little bit like the B1s where assembling them was more difficult than painting them. <laughs> um, they do lend themselves to like an airbrush, wash, dry brush kind of situation. And I think too, I'm excited to do like some more vibrant colors with these guys because they're bugs. Yeah. Uh, is that where the pink was coming in on your desk? It It is actually. One of the things I'm considering is doing um, like a greenish, something like like this one. Mm -hmm. uh it is not showing up well because i have a green screen <laughs> but um like a br kind of like a bright green from the top down and then go with the pink from the bottom up and it creates this interesting like i actually kind of did this with bosk um it was more like a darker green for bosk but basically like his lizard skin you know it's mostly green but then you have this like kind of pinkish underside and it looks really i, I think it looks really cool so um i might try that with the Dino Notions, I also 
uh, unironically thought of doing like a bumblebee theme. Mm. Um, <laughs> because if you look carefully at the Gene Oceans, there's no way this is going to show up on the camera. So I won't even try it. But basically, like the actual parts of their torso, they actually have like segmented textured lines that go across their not an insect expert Indeed. thorax whatever the thorax yeah, yeah um that are kind of like a like a bees where it would be very easy to just paint like clearly defined lines there uh and i can already think of like five hilarious list names that you could do if your entire gene ocean army looked like a swarm of bees um so i also considered that briefly except that yellow is horrible I think the, the what paint. I want to see happen is uh, every time I'm assembling the guys that are just like standing up, all I can think of is the alien dude from Family Guy. Um, what's his name? He's like, you know who I'm talking about, yeah, right? Yeah, the dude yeah, that like yeah. lives in their house. Yeah. Uh, um, what's his name? Do you mean Roger from American Dad? Maybe it's American. It's American Dad. It, yeah. Maybe it's American Dad. Yeah. Maybe it's not Family Guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, he's like the weird, like perverted alien that just like you know, uh, just they look a little bit like that guy. They totally do. <laughs> look at them more; you will see it more and more as you look at the dude standing. And like the thing is, I had a couple guys that were like standing, like kind of slanted and like off to the side a little bit. And like the more dudes you assemble like that, the more you're like, yeah, this looks just like this dude. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just think an army of of like him would be would be funny just um, throw some like little beer bottles on the base or something yeah, like that for yeah. the guys that are leaning <laughs> totally <laughs> what color oh he's gray oh that's kind of boring it is his color like... scheme is pretty boring but yeah um is it it's american dad you said it is yeah. american dad okay. yeah you, you can tell how often i watch these shows by uh um by that but yeah all, all i could think of was him assembling his mom uh, <laughs> yep, i see it now i'm yeah, looking at yeah. him right now and uh -huh. like, yep, <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. um so and yeah uh yeah all right well we're the notorious scoundrels i'm kyle i'm mike i'm mike stay fresh cheese bags <laughs>